when we got settled, parked the ride, and you know, walking down the block or on Broadway, and we went into this uh, doorway, and it was a stairwell going straight up. I ascended the stairwell, and uh, nothing to it. The door opened up, but when I crossed over that threshold, my eyes got biggest sources, and my jaw probably sunk down to my belly button because I was amazed. All right, so today is January 25th, 2024. Um, who are we speaking with? Okay, my name is Bernard Hanna, uh, otherwise known in those days, years and years ago, as Juice. Tell us about the nickname Juice. How did you get that nickname and what does that name mean to you? Okay, well, it's a lifelong name. That's uh, from my mom. You know, she uh, gave all of her children. I'm a product of uh, two sisters and a brother, and we all, except Cindy, we all had nicknames. I had my brother Monk, and then I had my sister Boo Boo, and of course, I'm the oldest. I was Ju I was Juicy in the uh, early days, and as uh, I got older, and uh, one, to make mention though, it wasn't a, 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 whole, a whole name for the street. People that learned that name back those times were people that came to the house, and that's what we called each other. My mom called me, my brother, as I called them, Monk, Boo Boo, and that type of thing. And then, you know, it just vibrated, got out there into the world. And of course, it was shortened from Juicy to Juice. Then even some in some places, Juice Juice. But that's what it is, family nickname. And it means a, a lifetime to me because that's what it is. From all I can remember, as I was told, my mom, she named me that. She used to give a lot of uh, card parties. And as a baby, I used to crawl around on the floor and run up the ladies' legs and stuff and climb up in their laps and squeeze their breasts. And, you know, I guess I was a little chunky baby. And she said, yeah, that's my juicy baby. That type of thing. Tell us about the first time you went to the loft. Just paint a picture of what did you see? What did you hear? What did you smell? How did you discover it? Who took you to the loft? Tell us the first time. And also... There have been very, very many iterations of the loft. Which loft did you go to? Prince and Mercer, Broadway, Avenue C. Like, so tell us about the first time you went to the loft and then which loft yeah, you went to in the background. Yeah. yeah, well, I guess I was initially probably at the first loft, Broadway and Bleecker. A good friend of mine, Lindsay, Lindsay Pruitt, I remember one afternoon, you know, uh, at that time I was living out in uh, Freeport, Long Island. And uh, I recall, he lived around the corner from me. He had a beautiful fastback Mustang. And uh, I ran up on him under the light and I was hollering at him. And he's like, yo, man, you want to hang out tonight? I was like, yeah, where? He said, I'm going down to the village. I was like, yeah, okay. Now, and I didn't frequent the village that often. You know, I was more Brooklyn when, the, you know, being born and raised in Brooklyn, but at that time, mom moved us out to uh, Long Island uh, by way of uh, Jamaica, then to Long Island. But anyway, to the point, my first experience was Broadway and Bleecker. Went with Lindsey Pruitt. And I'll tell you something, Em. No idea what I was getting into, where uh, I was going to see and experience. But was it amazing? Let me tell you this. When we got settled, parked the ride, and you know, walking down the block or on uh, Broadway, and we went into this uh, doorway, and it was a stairwell going straight up. I ascended the stairwell, and uh, nothing to it. The door opened up, but when I crossed over that threshold, my eyes got biggest sources, and my jaw probably sunk down to my belly button because I was amazed. Like you mentioned, the smells, the first thing hit me after viewing it, the smell, the, the odor was so miraculous. It's like a diffuser when you go into department stores now, but that was way back then. That was while his people, his, uh, uh, his crew that was set up and everything, the smell was amazing. The view was outstanding, incredible. It was the cord as it was back on Prince and Mercer. It was a canopy, a parachute. 
It was a parachute draped up into the ceilings with balloons all over the joint. And what I did that whole evening was just look and listen. I probably snapped my fingers and pop my feet, pat my feet, but not too much dancing because I wasn't dancing like that. What it was, the music was so electrifying. The people were beautiful. These were probably entertainers. They were dressed other than I've never seen before. This was village style. Never seen that dress before. Like I said, I'm born and raised out of Brooklyn, born in Williamsburg, grew up in Brooklyn. And uh, I did my, my, my toe stomping in that, in, in that environment, Brooklyn, then we moved to Queens, then we moved to Long Island. And uh, the village was a whole new entity. That was my introduction. That was my introduction going into Broadway and Bleecker, and it was life-changing as far as clubbing. After that, how often would you go to the loft? Well, it was as I come to learn, that was the first time. And uh, I didn't go back thereafter, probably for a couple of months maybe, but I had an incredible time. It was, uh, at the time, I didn't even know it was only a Saturday party, but... Uh, Lindsay, I bumped into Lindsay again, and I was like, yo, man, when are you going back to uh, that spot? He was like, yo, whenever you want to go. So we went back once again. It was some time after. And that's when we learned that they were moving to Prince and Mercer. So I had an enjoyable time. And when they went to Prince and Mercer, it was another entity in what was the same, but even more intense. Because as I mentioned, going up that a cell of stairway into this opening was like a, a flat, a, a, a cold front, straight back and straight forward, just up and down, that's it. And uh, when we got to Prince and Mercer, of course, that was uh, downstairs and upstairs. But once I got to Prince and Mercer, that probably was Every Saturday, it was well worth the wait through the course of the week, uh, doing your business, working, whatever you had to do, home chores, girlfriend, hanging out with her, when you had one anyway. <laughs> and uh, I, spent, I spent a great many Saturdays at the law for a great many years, uh, half of a lifetime at the law on Prince and Mercer. And of course, that was uh, 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 coming off of uh, the sideway when you went downstairs to get in. And the, oh, let me show you something. Here we have, which is memorialized. You've seen this before, right? Can you bring it closer to the camera? You've seen this before, correct? Uh, we don't see that. Can you hold it up to your face? Because we don't see it. Oh, there we oh. go. Yes, yeah, there we go. Yep, we see it. Yep, we know yeah. it. Yep. This has been memorialized. I've memorialized it. This was my invitation, as you can see on the back, mm -hmm. your invitation and my name. This is quite old, and uh, this is part of part of my 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 uh, uh, nightlife. This was the invitation, of course, when you became a full fledged member, as you know, probably as you made clear, you've done uh, law interviews with other people. So I'm sure they mentioned it, you know, to be a member. Uh, when I got when went back to uh, Broadway and Bleecker, I was a, I was a guest of Lindsay. And same thing when I got over to uh, Prince and Mercer, he sponsored me for a membership. And that was fantastic as well, because here's how they worked it. As not being a member, you were a guest, you know, you just couldn't pop in off the street, especially back then. I'm talking about 71, 71, 72. Yeah, you couldn't pop in off the streets. And a lot of people that I know that I've met weren't there then. I met them years later, I guess when they became aware of uh, the law. So um, when Lindsay sponsored me and I got my personal invitation, I was able now to uh, sponsor guests in 
and call guests. As a matter of fact, he had a crack a crack team, uh, probably about a dozen. Uh, you could call up and leave your guests over the phone if you weren't coming or they were coming at a later time or they were going to get there earlier than you. You can call up their 212 number and speak to uh, Rock, or Penny, most likely Penny. She was one of the persons that worked there and let her know this is Bernard Hanna and uh, my guest number, whatever it was. And I like to leave this, that and whose name. So that way, when they got there, they didn't need to wait for me. OK, you know, when you got downstairs and I'm a guest of and they went to their sheet, their guest list sheet, went down to me and saw underneath they had it in percent parentheses. Bernard Hanna, guest, Jane Doe, John Doe, and so forth and on, like that. So that was the beginning of the bittersweet. That was the beginning of the bittersweet. And I've met so many wonderful people down there that uh, I say some are not with us today. God bless them and rest in peace. And then there are those that are still around. And contacts have been... Not as, not as frequent, of course, because that's years and years ago. How old were you when you first went to the loft? I think I was about 20, 21. And then when you went to the loft, how long did you transition from just going and watching and snapping your fingers to being part of the dancers and getting down on the floor? Right after, uh, that would have been Prince and Mercer. Yeah, that would have been Prince and Mercer. And... Uh, I learned, I learned how that dancing was, because you know how you go out to a club, you get vaguely dressed casually. Of course, as I came to learn, that wasn't that type of spot, especially if you're going to dance, because you come out of there sweaty, I mean, tore down, your clothes uh, all over the place, which was cool. But uh, yeah, I was on that dance floor because the music, I, the music just took you away. Dave was intricate. He was meticulous. And the music he played, I didn't hear any other place, any other club. Not that music he played. And then for the loft, were you, did you prefer to be upstairs or downstairs? Yes, I was uh, primarily 95% downstairs. Yeah, I was a floor dancer. Downstairs was very well lit all night long. Upstairs was mellow, low key. I was downstairs and how I learned, uh, before I would go to the loft, I probably would end up at a spot, you know, with a change of clothes always. I might be dressed for somewhere I'm going, knowing that I'll be going down to the loft because as they were, open up at 12 and close uh, seven, eight, nine. So I knew as I come to learn the dancing that I started doing, is to bring a change of clothes. And like, for example, I would go to the Blue Note. You remember the Blue Note, right? On yep. West Third Street, right around the corner from the cage. I go there and catch a set, the, the last show, you know, see uh, little Jimmy Scott or uh, Celia Cruz, you know, and uh, 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 I would leave there and just walk over to uh, the loft, walk through the square and go on the other side, cross Houston, and there I am. I had my little briefcase with my change of clothes because uh, that was that was me. You know, I always dressed. That's how I rolled. I always dressed when I went out. But the loft, you can dress, but man, make sure you bring your change of clothes so you can get down. You don't want to be hindered. You want to do your thing. Once you became a member, how often would you go to the loft? Oh, every Saturday, every Saturday for the first number of years. Oh, really? Every Saturday. Every Saturday. Didn't miss a beat. And I have to say, probably a lot of people, once they got introduced to it, they didn't miss They didn't miss a beat. If you missed, if you didn't come to the law, it was something that was really important that you were doing. You know, you might have been sick, whatever, you know. You could have been, you might have been out of town. But, uh, yeah, it's not that you waited for it because you knew it was there and you knew Saturday was coming. As they, as they say, the eagle flies on Saturday, Friday rather, Saturday you go out to play. Saturday night was the joint. Now before that, you know, I was dancing uh, every day of the week in different spots, but not like that, not like that, man. That, that music took you away, 
took you to ultimate levels that I've never experienced. I'm not going to speak for anybody else, but for me, the the levels that took me on uh, that dance floor, that music, and I just got better at it. I got better at it. The rhythm, the vibe, the beat, like you got your five, six, five, six, seven, eight. What I mean by that, his, 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 his music was so clear, you can catch every rhythm, beat, change, and that's how I danced. I danced to the beat, to the rhythm, to the change. Never kept one, one flow. When I heard something, it moved me to another move. It moved me to another step. For example, like if I was list, listening to, uh, not listening to, if it came on, one of my favorites, uh, Munich Machine, get on the funk train. All of it was great. The music was fantastic. But you, you know, there might be a special part and you know, you find yourself, for example, like you dancing and all of a sudden you just burst into the air. You know, you tuck, bend, hit the ground, fold and roll. That was like one of, one, one, of, one, one of the probably intricate moves that some people did. Some people did. That was just like burst into the air, get a nice two feet off the ground and just jackknife down to a handstand, tuck and roll in time with the music. And of course, you know, you wasn't hurting yourself because you knew what you was doing. How would you describe your dance style? Oh, I was fluent. I was very fluent. I was like a pretty hands, pretty feet smooth, gliding on glass, on ice, along with rhythm. You know, I was able to move my body or my torso one way with my hands, another way with my feet going uh, backwards, forwards, sideways. So yeah, I was like like a uh, buck and bubbles, if you recall them from the 30s, uh, especially uh, bubbles, tap dancer, uh, let's see, uh, the Berry Brothers, trio tap dancers from the 30s, 40s. Nicholas Brothers, of course. Very pretty hands, very smooth, and gliding like a wave. Nice and fluent. Do you have any particular memories of the loft that stand out, a particular night where you were on fire or Marcuso was on fire and it was like, oh, shit, this is why I do this? Oh, yeah, man, let me tell you like it is. Sweet Jesus. Let's see. Uh, wait, first of all, we had a host of uh, cats that uh, I've come to meet and become very fond of. Uh, Legs, a.k.a. Jimmy from Staten Island. God bless him. Uh, Karate Rick, who is now Master Rick. As a matter of fact, Rick is the one who sponsored me for this interview. And uh, let's see. Uh, Chris, Karate Chris. God bless him. And... Uh, He's not with us no longer, but, uh, you know, you got out there and you fed off of the next person. Like for example, legs might go out there. He was very, very flexible. He probably not probably, he could do a, a vertical stretch straight up and down a hundred degrees. And Chris, he was very, uh, uh, moderate on the floor as well, but getting to the point where you say what was on fire. Dave was playing music like Sarone, uh, 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 Love and C Minor, uh, War, City, Country, City, and the music, there was there were changes in it that took you to another level, and we all were out there. Kano, back in the day, you know, uh, uh, who I, I like dancing with, a Smoke, he was just a clown, Smoke, Smokey, called him Smoke. Young fella, but he was a cool dude. And, you know, he just had that way about him. He had a way about his dance that just was, uh, you know, give you, a, a, give you a chuckle. But he was a really fun guy. And, uh, you know, the females, for example, Sophie and uh, Joy and Lucy, these were girls back then, you know, freestyle and hustle. 
As a matter of fact, speaking of uh, hustle, it was a small hustle crew back then. Uh, good fellow, Mike Holder, strictly hustle. Mike Holder, God bless him, he's gone too. Maggie, God bless her, she's gone too. Uh, Sophie, Joy, Lucy, great hustles, hustle dances. I didn't hustle as much, or I probably at all. I did a little, but not as much as my freestyle. And, uh, you know, being, being back then, back then, you know, I just wasn't doing hustle like they were because there was a small hustle crowd and they were great hustlers too. Sophie, Lucy, Mike, uh, Green Eye, Ricky, uh, 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 Trini, his boy, Kathy from uh, West 11th Street. She's right there in the village. And she used to teach up at uh, Fred Astaire's up in Midtown. She was a ballroom teacher. But on fire was, there was a lot of those nights. Dave bring on music, for example, when Dr. Buzzett's original, original Savannah's band, Che Che La Femme and all of that good music, that whole A and B side. Never heard of them before. When Dave played it, man, fire, fire. They were the it, they were the it group. Dr. Buzzett's original Savannah's band, everything on that album was top notch. You could dance to all of it and it would bring it out you too because they, they hit you. The style of their dress was somewhat like I used to dress. They dressed out of thirties. They had on their nice chalk striped suits, wing tip, two-tone shoes, Stetson hats. The fellas, you know, Apple Jacks, baggy pants. You know, speaking of baggy pants, like I said, you know, when I used to go down there, I'd always have my change of clothes. I started out with sneakers, wasn't working. Couldn't get my slide on. Then uh, legs, he was uh, he was in the art. Chris, Karate Chris, Master Rick, legs, they were all in the art. And uh, Legs is the one who turned me on to some Kung Fu slippers. Those were nice. I did that for a number of years. Baggy pants. He gave me my first pair of drawstrings. And so that would have, you know, T-shirt would suffice. But then you wanted to, like, really fluff it up and, and look fly. So, you know, you went down to the thrift shops or wherever and got a nice pair of baggy pants. And not, not thereafter, but probably... Uh, uh, a year or two or three, maybe, got hip to Capizio's. They had a nice little spot right off of 8th Street, Capizio shop, right between 8th Street and the square. So I went down there. As a matter of fact, talking about here, these are mem memorialized too. Here they go. These were white. These were white. I had them dyed red. And of course, I had the soles done. I haven't wore these in so many years. Many years I haven't wore these, and I have them scribed on here. The Loft 99, as a matter of fact, 99 Prince Street, 1972, New York, New York. And then I have some of my favorite people. I got Lisa, who lived on West Third Street around the corner from the cage, her sister Nikki, Joy, and Kathy. And Kathy lived over on West 11th, and uh, Joy lived out in Elmhurst. Sophie lived in Brooklyn, Lucy lived in Bay Ridge. Genie, in fond memory of the square, after the after, after the loft. But these are but these are memorialized. These are the only two memorialized memorabilia I have from the, along with my memories, my dancing shoes, and my invitation from the from the day. Wow. How would you describe David Mancuso for someone that's never met him? Okay. Dave was a soft-spoken fella. Uh, my personal view, I looked at Dave as an introvert, but brilliant, brilliant. He would take his, for example, he'd take his uh, equipment and spend hours on hours fine-tuning it, his sound system, his turntables, uh, we were friends. He knew me. I knew him. We were friends. As a matter of fact, he gave me a kitten. I named the kitten Snuggles. Pure white. He had six uh, claws. He had an extra, uh, extra uh, index on his, uh, on his paw. But yeah, Dave gave me that kitten. And uh, he would always ask about 
the kitten. And when he asked me, what was the name? What did you name him? I said, Snuggles. Because he would always jump up in the bed. Well, I kept him up in the bed with me in the beginning because he was a kitten. And I had him in his entire life. And he would ask me fondly, how's the kitten doing? And uh, I think he very well appreciated the fact that I don't know why he gave him to me. If he was getting rid of him, I had too many. But he was happy to know that he was in a, a good, loving home. And uh, he was, like I said, soft-spoken. And he didn't have, uh, that I've ever noticed, uh, a, 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 a bunch of people. But he had some very close friends that I've met that I come to uh, uh, know and enjoy. Uh, for example, um, Balkis. And her sister, Soraya, and the sister, Kika, they were very close to David, uh, along with Maggie. They were very close to David. And uh, this was, you know, back in the 70s, the early 70s, how I met them. As a matter of fact, Mike, Mike and uh, Dana, they were, they were all very close to, to David. They used to spend times with him where I, they probably go out to dinner. They probably would go out to dinner. They would help him uh, decorate the place. Uh, when uh, he had his crew and his very close friends like that come in and they chit chat over putting things together. Because as I mentioned, with the uh, uh, membership card, there was a mailing list. They would send out mailers, you know, send out mailers of event might be coming up. You know, they would send out stuff. And uh, he had a crackpot crew, about a dozen, his cleanup crew. You know, they buff that floor to a nice shine and slide. And uh, like I said, downstairs was highlight. Bright, well, well lit, bright. Upstairs was a more mellow mood dark. Even though they, they got down, they, they threw it upstairs too, but nothing like downstairs. And, you know, up upstairs was a lot more uh, close and personal. Tell us about the sense of community at the loft. Everyone talked about it being a, a family or um, people develop friendships. Um, talk about that and even talk about any relationships that came out of the loft as well. Oh, absolutely. You hit the nail right on the head talking about family. Like I said, man, when I started going there, I met uh, uh, folks from around the boroughs, from uh, Crown Heights, for example, Billy. Billy, I met Billy from Crown Heights and uh, Lucy from Bay Ridge, uh, Sophie from right there in Manhattan and Mike and Dana, a couple from out of uh, East Elmhurst, uh, Balkis, Deliquest and her sister Soraya, you know, they're out of East Elmhurst, along with so many, many other people, close friends like Legs, very close, God bless them. Uh, I'm sure if people have mentioned Flame. Flame was a, 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 a close friend uh, as, as we become to develop. Because I've met Flame in Brooklyn. I met Flame in Brooklyn at the, at the Iron Rail down on Bedford and Sterling. How I met him, he was introduced by two girls that I knew that uh, lived over there in the uh, Brooklyn on Eastern Parkway down by Camden Proud Plaza, Liz and Andrea, Jamaican girl and a Puerto Rican girl. And they knew Flame. They knew Flame. They knew Flame before I did, but just so happened, coincidentally, you know, they introduced me to Flame. And uh, Flame was out of Albany Projects. You know, he was with a dancing group. And uh, it, was a, it, was, it was a cool guy. Uh, we didn't see each other a lot back then when we met, but over the many, many years, we became very close, you know, friends that we kept in contact over the phone and stuff like that would meet, you know, uh, over at the Sylvia's up in Harlem for brunch or something like that. Or I might pop in uh, uh, his apartment, you know, take a ride up there to the Bronx. But uh, family orientated, yeah. Uh, Maggie, Lucy, and Joy, Soraya, Balkis, Mike, Green Eyed Rick, Trini, Billy, Smoke. We became, now those, we became very close. Uh, some of those folks would see through the week, would get together. Then some of those folks wouldn't see until that Saturday night. But that Saturday night was a family affair. If you didn't see them at all through the week or weeks 
But when you saw him uh, on a Saturday night, you know, it wasn't like, yo, how you been? What you been doing? Blah, blah. It wasn't like that. It was like, yo, what's up, man? Boom, right into it. Something came on and we out there, out there on the floor. You know, we shared our friendship with our steps and our moves. We fed off each other. You know, somebody might do a, a crack move and like, wow, that was nice. And then you turn around and say, you know what? I'm going to serve you. I'm going to give it right back to you. I'm going to give you one, too. How you like this? So it was fun, fun, fun. Fun, fun, fun. What effect did the loft have, have on shaping the club scene and the club culture after it? Oh, yeah, man. Let me tell you, the loft was the spot. David was the man. Everybody piggybacked off of David. For example, Larry LeVan, first of all, let me give you a scenario how the loft was when I started going there. People know the loft upstairs where David had his booth or his tables set up right in front of the egress doors straight out to the street. When I started going there, he, he was up in a loft. He was on top of, you came upstairs, and when you came through the threshold, right on top was like a uh, balcony. And Dave had his system set up there, had a nice big picture window where he could look down on the whole floor. He was up top. He was up top then. You, he could look down on the whole floor all around. And uh, Dave had uh, Larry LeVan used to work the lights for him long before the garage uh, came to light. Uh, Mike Brody, I think he uh, he uh, uh, sponsored the garage, and that probably could have been in the works, not to my knowledge, but it probably was in the works while, you know, he was more, Larry LeVan was like a protege to Dave. He would let, not a lot of people got on that turntable either. He let Larry spin, infrequent that I recall, but he used to definitely work the lights, and then he used to get on the turntables uh, 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 sometimes thereafter. Now, pushing out to other clubs, Nikki Serrano had a spot right down the block, right on the corner of Houston, uh, the gallery. That was always there. That was always there as well. So it wasn't like he piggy banked. He had his own. He had his own crowd. It was probably uh, ninety nine percent gay. I went there once or twice. It was nice, but it wasn't my cup of tea. It wasn't my cup of tea. Then, of course, uh, you had uh, Billy Graham. He used to do a, a, a produce a lot of parties too. He piggybacked off of Dave. He used to piggyback. He had places like oh, Wyona. I used to call it the Wyona, the Wyona spot down on Wyona Street in Brooklyn. He used to give spots down there. Uh, 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 you had this uh, uh, Mike Stone. Same thing. He piggybacked off of Dave. He did uh, Bonds International and a few other spots. Bonds was a hit for him because Bonds was huge and he had that place full. He had hostesses in there, you know, uh, uh, checking you out to, you know, you need a drink, this, that, and the other. He 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 had very well established that, that spot for as long as it lasted, which wasn't very long, but as long as it did last, he made money. But I'm sure he spent money too in that rent because as I said, Bonds was huge. And then, of course, uh, 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 the kid from uptown on 54, 54th Street, you know, he piggybacked off of Dave. Dave was a big influence to a lot of cats. You know, I, I met some, you know, Bobby Bobby Morales, not David Morales, Bobby Bobby Morales. You know, he was a he was more so a hustle, in a hustle crowd. Same thing as Paradise, this other kid, Paradise. They were both in a hustle crowd and. Uh, when I didn't uh, 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 freestyle, I'd go to their spots and hustle because they didn't freestyle up there. Everybody up there hustled. And uh, over the years and years and years, I, I got my hustle to a real a real groove. I got very good at it, very good at it. You know, I won a little $500 contest at a college, uh, CW Post out in Brookville. You know, that, that was cute. <laughs> The, guy, the girl who won previously was dancing with this other cat, Sammy. And uh, one night I was there, the Ratskeller. 
I was there. They had to they had the hustle contest, and uh, she knew I could dance, but she didn't know how good I was. But she wasn't looking to you know win a contest. It was like let's just partake, and so we did. And so you know, I kind of uh, shocked her. She was like, "Damn, kid, I didn't know you were smooth like that." But back to uh, Dave's influences. Yeah, he had also this female, Colleen Murphy, aka Cosmo. She had a she didn't own any spots, but she had some DJ gigs that she used to spin out over in the Bowery, and uh, she had a she had a radio show out of NYU. She she play her wares on the ones and twos and. She was absolutely influenced by uh, Dave because that's why I liked her so much. She played the music he played, and that was the music I enjoyed. You know, it gets you like up and ready and like, let's do this. And of course, you had uh, Jimmy. Jimmy was a protege to, to God bless him. He passed on too. He was a protege to Billy Graham. They used to hustle those little house parties. They used to hustle those little house parties or get a basement and, you know, charge uh, whatever. And and uh, Jimmy get on the tables and do their things. Of course, they get their uh, music. I'm sure you heard of the record pool. They get their music from the record pool. And uh, it was a small cachet of people that knew about the loft. It was a small cachet, uh, especially out of the out of boroughs. It got out by word of mouth. You say, yo, man, I went to this spot. And it kept spreading like wildflower. Yo, I went to this spot. People were coming from Long Island, Jersey, Philly, Connecticut, you know. And uh, it was an experience that everybody felt. No one came to that place and wasn't mesmerized. No one. And I, I, that I will speak on everybody because it wasn't that type of club, a club unbeknown to those that you might have went to and hung out at. Coming down to the loft was an experience of a change of life as far as clubbing. What? Oh, actually, how should I ask this? Uh, what was your reaction when the loft ended? And oh how did, well, and how, how well, did long impact? before it ended, I I I I stopped really participating. For example, when he left Broadway and Bleecker, which was a blow, I always thought he owned the owned the place because he made money. He made good money just for the one night too. He didn't sell nothing except admission. So to, oh, for over the years that I've gone, I always thought he owned it, and. Uh, he didn't. He didn't loan it out for, um, as I remember, he didn't loan it out like rent it out for anything other than what he did on Saturday nights. And if he did, I had no knowledge of it. But I always thought he owned it. And when he lost it, because it was it was it was in the grapevine that I remembered he was off at the spot, and he didn't take advantage of it. I don't know if that's true or not because. You know, I wasn't part of that. I heard that, and I've always known not to always believe somebody else's uh, mindset when they pass in other information on, opposed to where it comes from the natural source. So, when he did decide that had had not decide when he had to leave, he went over to uh, Alphabet City, and I I had gone down there for a while, but it was never the same. And he left there and went somewhere else and maybe somewhere else, and then it was over, period, except for once in a while he uh, threw his mailing list and, and word of mouth, he had those special parties where he was charging $40, $50. And had a big turnout, too. Had a big turnout. It wasn't no, you know, it wasn't no skeleton crew. He had always a big turnout. As a matter of fact, one of the nights that I went, uh, Master Rick, he put me on his comp list. He put me on his comp list, and I went down and had a great time. Now, he had a protege, uh, Doug, Doug Sherman. He was over at the law firm, Prince and Mercer. He used to play frequently for, for Dave as uh, I became uh, friends with Doug. You know, uh, uh, congratulations to 
his lengthy marriage to uh, Soraya. They probably been married 20 years or more. God bless them both. And uh, he played for Dave and he used to play at these uh, special parties that, uh, as a matter of fact, you know what's so ironic, M? There's a song, I can't remember. I, I got bits and pieces of the melody in my head, but it was one of my favorite songs and I never took the time out to find out what was the name of the group and the name of the song. And to this day, some 35 years later, I still got it in my head and I can't put it together to be able to, you know, Google, tell me what was the name of this. And the only place I know I'll ever hear it, if Cosmo, Doug, God bless Dave, he's not here no longer, you know, played it. Just coincidentally, and I heard it, and I say, that's it. That's the song. One of my favorite songs out of all of them. That was a good hustle song. Freestyle, too, but I like the melody was so soft that it was a good hustle, a good hustle song, and I used to enjoy with Joy and Sophie. They were terrific hustle dancers. Kathy, well, all of them was those that small crew that did hustle. A lot of people didn't couldn't hustle, didn't know how, you know, and wouldn't hustle because if you was out there, uh, uh, you're not gonna get out there, uh, you know, uh, uh, sidestepping and not being fully down, not being fully down. You're not gonna get out on that floor, even freestyling. You know, you probably those would you know lean on the side up until they got you know their feeling encouragement and felt like yeah, I I can swing, I can throw it now. But hustle, nah, because like I said, downstairs was very well lit. And you were being looked upon. You were being looked upon, you know, your your, your dance style. Everyone could dance, just that some dance better than others. That's all. And no, nobody was nobody was uh, you know, tripping off nobody about, you know, you can't dance or baba that, baba this, humma humma humma. It wasn't like that. You know, everybody did their thing, felt good at it, and you know, nobody was criticizing or looking upon nobody uh, how they did their thing. It was all like like you made clear, family oriented. Nobody snarked on nobody that I that I can say. And then the perfect segue to the, my last question: How would you summarize the legacy of the loft? Oh yeah, the originator. Not one of the best, the best. Like I said, there was no club in Manhattan was slick as that, was slick as the loft. None of And see, this on Broadway and Bleecker, got to be reminded, Broadway and Bleecker was not the same crowd as Prince and Mercer. As a matter of fact, they didn't even dance like they did Prince and Mercer as they were dancing up in uh, Broadway and Bleecker. That dance on Prince and Mercer was electrifying, high powered. That dance over on uh, Broadway and Bleecker was mellow. Because like I said, it was a whole different crowd. That was a whole different crowd. The crowd that they have down on Prince and Mercer was not the crowd they had up on Broadway and Bleecker. And like I said, these people were more, more or less uh, like, uh, I, was, I, would, I would have to say out of the entertainment world, they were more like lounging, lounging, you know? For example, one night I was uh, on Broadway, not Broadway, Prince and Mercer. And uh, out of nowhere, this this young woman, you know, started dancing around me and dancing, which was nothing unusual. That's how we did it. Nobody asked somebody to dance. You just get out on the dance floor. If you wanted to run up on somebody and dance with them, that's what you did or vice versa. Anyway, this girl danced with me for a long time. You know, made conversation, chit chatted and all. And, you know, hours went by and I, in my mind, I was like, hmm, is she biting, shooting hearts and everything? So anyway, <laughs> this fella comes over to her and was like, gives her a kiss on the cheek. And she says, uh, Juice, this is my boyfriend, Charles. And uh, I was like, wow, OK. Now, this cat was about six, five. Uh, strong built turned out to be and i knew him i knew of him i knew of him not him he was charles williamson 
He was the one of the highest paid. Google it one day, Charles Williamson. He was one of the highest, no, probably the highest black male models back then. Back then it was Richard Pryor, Charles, was, uh, Charles Williamson, and I think Renault White came a little bit after that. He blew up too. But that's who it turned out to be. I mean, I knew, when I saw his face, I knew exactly who it was. I just didn't remember the name. And when she said, this is Charles, and I was like, yeah, I've seen you around. He said, yeah, you might have seen me around. Being modest, which I would have did the same thing. And she was like, yeah, yeah, he's on the cover of uh, Ebony, uh, GQ, and so forth. And I said, yeah, I know. I've seen him modeling the you know, clothes and stuff. But uh, it was so, uh, so cool that the way he came over, very nonchalant, very polite. And uh, she was like, OK, <laughs> my time with you. Not in words, but you can get the sense. Body language. My time with you is over. <laughs> my man is here now. <laughs> See ya. But uh, it, it was magnificent. The loft to me today is one of the most wonderful time in my life. I'll never forget it. Always have fond memories of the people. A lot of people passed on that I remember from the loft. Mike left us early. Jimmy left us early. Chris left of, left, left of us early, Flame, Maggie, and uh, people, of course, picked up and moved away, did a lot of things. You know, like I said, I'm born September 30th, 1953, uh, at 70 now. You know, my life is mellow. My wife is my, my, my rock, even though sometimes she gets under my skin, but that's a regular. You know, married life. But I'm fortunate to have her because, you know, I'm not alone. I got companionship. And uh, that's how I met her. She's a dancer. She, my wife's Puerto Rican. She's a dancer. That's how I met her up at the uh, 92nd Street Y. They had a salsa night. They had a salsa night. And I popped up in there because they used to have, cats used to promote parties up there at the 92nd Street Y hustle parties. And I used to go up there. As a matter of fact, that night I went up there, I thought it was a hustle night. Turned out to be a salsa night. Now my salsa is 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 uh, uh remember this uh, 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 blue magic welcome to the club one moment let me just tell my call him back yo bro let me get back to you okay all right yeah, yeah, I went up there uh, to 92nd Street. Why well, I think it was a hustle night. It turned out it was a, a salsa night. And of course, the only difference uh, uh, hustle and, 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 and salsa is just the move and the body movement. Otherwise, it's the same thing. Five, six, five, six, seven, eight. Or one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. That type of thing. That's how I danced. You know, I didn't, I didn't keep count. It's just that my body would stay on count and then i make counts out of the like i said the changes the beat the rhythm the vibe and uh all those wonderful people master rick karate chris legs flame uh uh mike holder his cousin carmelo a cosmo haven't seen her. i think last i heard of cosmo she was over in england uh spreading her music and uh People that I've mentioned, those were people that were uh, I was very close to. There's much more, you know, many more than they that they are than they are, of course. But uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Flame, his boy, um, Mike, Mike Dungey, nice guy. We was friends, not as close as Flame and I was, but you know, he was my. They were tight. They were tight. Uh, Mike Dungey, him and uh, him and Flame was tight. Like I said, I long before those they, these guys came, uh, Master Rick, Chris, it was a whole different crew when I went down there. When I when I started going down there, it was you know a green eyed green green eyed Ricky, another Ricky, uh, Trini, a Trinidadian, and his boy Trini, and Kathy and Lucy, and Elisa. You know, a lot of them lived right there in the village. Some lived uptown. Some lived over in uh, the East Village. And uh, Billy, you know, there was a lot of things that was happening. Let me mention this before you go. 
there was a lot of people who had vocal vibes. People would have uh, sayings. Uh, different people would have sayings. I remember I could hear only good guys wear black, which was which would which was which was a theme. Uh, 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 I could hear if your mama could see you now shaking that ass. Uh, what else was that? Uh, it's been so long. I had them have so many in my head. Who else is that? Uh, 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 I've lost him. But a lot of cats, Billy, ha cha cha cha, some type of way he did his mouth, you know? When I say ha cha cha cha, it's not exactly that, but that's what it probably would to to emulate it. But it would be much more finessed. But there was a lot of cats who had different sayings that they used to just belt out on the floor, and uh, it was all it was all in 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 the party in the life. And uh, my experience was top notch. Met some great people, and there's lots and lots I've seen the change. I've seen the change, like if you want to call it step one, step two, step three, step four, I've seen the change and the change uh, as they as they went along, as the time went along. But my fondest memories was the beginning of my experience in the loft when uh, Sophie and Lucy and Maggie and Joy and Angel and Mike and Green-Eyed Ricky and uh, all of the rest of those cats, Billy, Jimmy, Billy Graham, you know, those those are the cats. Smoke, he came there after too, but he was a cool cat. Smoke was a cool, Smokey, but he was a cool cat. The loft will never be duplicated. There's nobody, there's nobody who can conjure that up again. The loft was a, a, a lifetime of experience to behold. Dances, the dances, the dances were phenomenal. They all were there. They were all, they were all dancers. You know, in the loft, you know, they were all dancers in the loft and they could take their, their their skills to wherever they went to in other clubs. You know, people probably wouldn't understand it and say, how do you do that? Where do you get that from? But then after a while, you know, it changed up. Like when you mentioned when they moved, when they moved, it changed up. It, it wasn't the same. He had a crowd, but it wasn't the crowd. And uh, I, st I stopped going. And now and then I hear from somebody or I get something in the mail. Uh, 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 Balkis, she was, like I said, a very good friend of Dave. I might hear from her and uh, say, well, Dave is having a little something. Or I might run into somebody in the square and and, and say, yeah, yeah, uh, Dave is uh, throwing a little something down on St. Mark's, you know, down in the Bowery somewhere. And uh, what's the damage? Yeah, they charge him $40, $50, which was well worth it. Well worth it because his music was top notch. Music wasn't you, you weren't hearing on at that time. Who was the, who was the radio station? WBLS. They was playing good music. Because, see, I grew up with, with, with Motown, you know, uh, the Four Tops, Don't Bring Back Memories, and, and Shorty Long, Function at the Junction. You see, you know, always had dance in me, but. That dance that came out of me in the loft, that was the music. That was the music that was none like it, none like it. And now you can hear it because you can stream music from out of the country and you can hear people like uh, another, another high powered song, Disco Circus by Martin Circus. Now that had changes to the hill. That was high powered. You could really throw it on that song, Disco Disco uh, Circus, uh, you know, by Martin Circus. That had so many breaks and ups and downs. Five, six, five, six, seven, eight. Bam, bop, bop, boop. Leap into the air, jackknife, tuck and roll, you know, spin, working off the floor, everything. That's the kind of music he, that, that was one of the high powered songs for me. One of my, one of my favorite songs, fast tempo. Well, not real fast, but my tempo, my tempo. And I had a tempo. If it was fast, fast, I couldn't get into it. It had my tempo. But yeah, disco, di Martin Circus, disco circus. That was like a city, country, city war. That started out mellow and then it 
slide into upbeat. Then it slide into, okay, get ready. Then it went into go for yours. Because it was thunder. It was on. And that just took you. You left your body. <laughs> you left your body. Thank you so much for sharing your love story with us. This is amazing. So many. Yeah, thank you for having me, man. I, I, I'm very happy to have shared my my venture, my experience, and you know all the beautiful people that I've met and cherished, and I have them all in memory. Some of them I don't remember their names, and uh, I can see their faces if I if I really think and look for them in my head. But then there's those that I remember them distinctively because you know we were close. We were close like that. Here's another tidbit, Jimmy. You know. Four or five o'clock in the morning, we slide out to the bodega, come back with a couple of 32s or 40s, you know, a Budweiser, like we did in the square. After you leave the loft, those that went to breakfast and went to the square or those that went to the square, and, you know, rainy days, you know, you either went home or you went home with somebody, that type of thing, you know, but... Uh, I, I thank you for having me, and it's it's been very very pleasurable to you know talk about the days of wonder, wonderful times, and you keep doing what you're doing, you know. Thank I'm sure you so much. Other, I'm sure there's other law of participants. They have their experience. As a matter of fact, those that those that I remember, as I made mention of them. You know, they, they those are the folks that uh, I ran with back in the early days in the se early 70s. You know, then there came the middle 70s, the end of 70s, the birth of the 80s. That was a whole different a whole different scene of people, even though the loft was still throwing it. But it was a whole different uh, cachet of people. So, Mr. M, thank, thank you, you so for much. Me. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Me. Yeah, All man. Right. You have a good night. Yes, sir. Appreciate you. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Same.